Well, hello there, my friends. If you follow me on YouTube, you probably heard that I broke my arm. <laughs> so I thought I should use this as an opportunity to answer all those questions that come in in comments over email. Um, some of these questions are about my job and my career and how did I end up doing what I'm doing? And some of them are about cooking techniques. So today we're going to cover all that. And since these kinds of videos tend to be kind of long and disorganized, click on the description below the video. I'll list all the questions so you can easily navigate and get to the question that interests you. How did you break your arm? <laughs> I broke my arm playing tennis. So we were in LA. It was the first day of the first vacation. After COVID, we were visiting family that lives in California and Colorado, and we were playing tennis. And this was my first time back on the court for about a month because the month earlier, I hurt my back. <laughs> and um, the reason I probably hurt my back is because um, I'm a lazy bum when it comes to doing core strengthening, abs, stretching, all that stuff. I hate that stuff. I like cardio, I like jogging, I like tennis, so that's what I do. And I skip all those things that are supposed to be good for me. So anyway, so I hurt my back, but that got better. And we go on vacation and it's my first time back on the court. And I ran backwards incorrectly, of course, <laughs> using bad technique. You're supposed to turn sideways and I didn't. I just ran backwards and I fell and I used my left hand to kind of break my fall and I fell on that hand and broke it. Yeah, so in case you watch this channel and think of me as some sort of disciplined person who hones knives every day that she cooks, just wanted to let you know that that applies only to cooking. <laughs> In the rest of my life, I am a complete undisciplined mess. <laughs> so um, if you've ever cut yourself while chopping veggies and now you're scared to pick up a knife, I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel like uh, playing tennis helps me be a better instructor because tennis is something that I picked up very late in life, just a few years ago. And it helps me have empathy for people who are learning something when they are not 12 years old, where these things are hard and you have lots of bad habits and you, we all do our best and sometimes it just doesn't work out. <laughs> so I will try to be better about my abs and stretching and I'll try to be nice to my arm. I mean, I wasn't very nice to myself when I felt the first day. I, I absolutely hated myself. <laughs> but now I'm getting there and trying to accept the things you cannot change. So um, luckily, the, in LA, they couldn't put a cast on me because my hand was so swollen. So they said, well, put a brace on you. And when you, not a brace, what's it called? Some other thing that keeps us stiff. Anyway, they said, when you get to Boston, go to an orthopedic doctor, they'll put a cast on you. And by the time I got to Boston two weeks later and went to the doctor, they told me, you know what? It's just a fracture. It's not a biggie. We're not going to put a cast on you. We'll just give you a brace. So I'm in a brace for another couple of weeks and then I should be as good as new. So hopefully more cooking videos will be coming then. Um, so yeah, that's the story of my arm. If you want to encourage me to do more abs and stretching so that my back doesn't uh, fall apart on me again, um, how about in about six months, start leaving me comments saying, Helen, so are you stretching? Are you doing your core strengthening exercises? Because I'm sure I'll be very good for the next six months and then of course once my back is back to normal i'll probably start slipping but anyway so that's the story of the broken arm when did you decide to turn cooking into your career and was the journey hard when i went to college i studied computer science which i didn't particularly enjoy but i'm a kid of immigrants and i needed a practical profession 
So when I started getting jobs in software companies, I was not very happy. It wasn't my thing and um, I loved to cook. So in my mid-twenties, I started teaching cooking classes for fun and started getting restaurant internships to learn to do this seriously. I didn't know if it could be a career career, but I wanted to give it a shot. And so once I started getting enough customers for my cooking classes, which happened in my late twenties, around, yeah, something like that, I quit my software job and started doing cooking classes full time. And several years after that, I started doing YouTube videos. So that's the story. Was it hard? You know, yes and no. There were things that were hard. Um, you have to have a lot of patience because nothing happens overnight. Pretty much everything for me took a while. It took a while to build up the clientele for classes, uh, but not too bad, about maybe a couple of years. And it took much, much longer to get the YouTube channel really going. I've been doing this for almost 11 years and, um, you know, with the YouTube channel for almost 11 years. And as you can see, I still do not have a million subscribers. So, but I'm working on it. Um, so yes, you need to have a lot of patience and you have to love what you do because um, you, I had to learn so many things that I am not good at and things that I do not love to do. I had to learn how to market myself. I had to learn how to do all this video stuff. And um, I love teaching and cooking. I do not particularly love dealing with lighting and food styling and all, all that jazz. But I learned it because, you know, if you are a one person business, you have to learn all sorts of things. So in that sense, it was somewhat challenging. What was not very challenging for me and something that I really had it easy is that I did not have to worry right away about making this very profitable because I have worked for several years in the software industry when my husband was in grad school and then when he graduated from grad school he got a software job and so the nice thing is if one of you has a software job the other person can do fun things um, it is it was and still is very important for me to um, make money with what i do because otherwise i felt like my professional pride was on the line. It drove me nuts when people thought that I quit my software job to be a stay-at-home mom with a little cooking hobby on the side. I take what I do very seriously. I take teaching cooking as seriously as people take being a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. And it felt like if I can make money with it, then other people will take me seriously but there was no pressure like my children were not gonna go hungry if i did not bring in the bacon <laughs> so in that sense it was not very hard if you had to do something else for a living besides cooking what would it be so i would probably still be a teacher i absolutely love to teach but i would not be a normal classroom teacher I would probably be a reading teacher. I love teaching reading. I'm dyslexic and I have two dyslexic children and all of us, well, I read a ton. My other kid, my older kid reads a ton now. My younger kid is getting there. So I love teaching things to people who are very smart and very hardworking, but have difficulty learning some particular thing, like whether it's knife skills or reading or math, um, you know, they might be amazing at math and have serious difficulties with reading. So that's my kind of teaching where I can really figure out what isn't working and try to fix it. Teaching in the classroom usually requires um, classroom control and discipline and all those other teaching things that uh, I'm terrible at. <laughs> so, so I think I'd be a reading specialist. Yeah. 
What are your goals for the channel and your business post-COVID? Will in-person classes resume? Yes, in-person classes will resume in September. I just posted my September schedule and I'll still continue making videos. I will try very hard to keep up my once a week video schedule, but of course it will be a little bit harder with the in-person classes and also with my kids getting back to school, which means driving them to activities. I kind of liked the COVID life where if a kid needs a music lesson or French lesson, they just hop on Zoom, but now that's not gonna be my life starting in September. Uh, so I'll have to try to figure out how to make it all work. What are your favorite cuisines and why? So I think my favorite cuisines are French and Spanish. And here is why. I love cuisines that steal from other cultures. It's actually uh, really ironic and it's kind of a paradox that the cultures that whose politics I really don't respect, whose politics were terrible, you know, Spain, France, these are the countries that were colonizing the world and pillaging and stealing and killing and doing horrible, horrible things in the world. Um, but that also resulted in them taking ingredients and cooking techniques and wonderful, beautiful cultural things from other people, which is horrible. <laughs> but the cuisines that they produced are wonderful. Uh, so I find that there are lots of things in life that uh, have this paradox that sometimes the cultures with the most horrible dictators produce the most brilliant artists and writers. And um, unfortunately, that's how humanity is. I hope one day we can have the best of both worlds where we can have amazing food without um, the downsides. Is there a dish that you feel intimidated to make? Yes, so um, I like to have control of my heat. Actually, in the next video, I will make a whole Q&A video about heat because heat is kind of a huge thing with cooking. And so what intimidates me is things like uh, live fire, grilling, smoking, um, things where you can't just turn a knob and turn the temperature up and down. I like to be in control of that knob and adjust it whenever I want. And you can't really do that with charcoal grilling or smoking. So those things do intimidate me. I feel like I could learn to do it, but to do it well, you have to do it all the time. And those are just not techniques that are practical for me to do on a daily basis. Why do you primarily cook food from the Mediterranean? Did you take an inspiring trip there or do you have a particular taste for the cuisine? So when I was in college in my senior year, I studied abroad in the south of France, in Provence, and I loved it. I loved the food, I loved the produce, the seafood, everything, and so um, that cuisine somehow became very close to my heart. And after that, when we started, when I graduated from college and we started going to Europe on vacations, we most often went to Mediterranean countries, uh, Spain, south of France, Italy. And it felt like I understood that system of cooking. Once you understand how one of those cuisines works, you can just figure out the other cuisines. Um, I find that cooking is very systematic, and so um, that's the cuisine that I know the most about. How do you feel about offal? Do you have a favorite organ, a favorite meal made from it? Liver is probably my favorite. Duck liver, chicken liver, well, veal liver is good too. Of foie gras, of course. So my favorite meal <laughs> made from it, um, you know, probably just some sauteed chicken livers are fabulous and chicken liver pate um, usually. Unfortunately, I don't cook it a ton at home because I kind of, um, 
I failed to introduce it to my kids early on and the, I would only cook it for special occasions and then they never developed a taste for it. So they absolutely hate it. My husband and I love liver and my kids don't. So I don't end up cooking it that much. Um, but whenever I'm in restaurants, if I see anything made out of liver, I usually order it. Do you know much about cultured cell based meats and where to find them and which brands offer the best quality? What are your thoughts on these meats and would you ever use them in your cooking? So uh, cell based meats or cultured, are they called yeah, cultured meats? Uh, meat that is grown from real animal cells in, well, it used to be in a lab, but I'm sure soon it's going to be in factories. Uh, so there is no animal that you raise and kill. You just grow the muscle. But it is completely different from Impossible Burger and all those meat alternatives, because those are made from plant protein, while these meats are actually made from real animal cells. And so I think it is the most fabulous concept. Unfortunately, it is not available in the US yet. I heard the only two countries where you could buy something. I'm not sure if you could buy it as a home cook or if you could buy it in a restaurant that have cell based meats are Singapore and Israel, if I remember correctly, but I'm sure it's coming soon. So uh, there's so many reasons that I think this would be fabulous. Well, obviously, the environmental impact of those meats would be way less than raising animals. Uh, you know, raising animals is a huge carbon footprint. Um, another thing is the ethics, right, of not killing the animals. And from a culinary perspective, I think it would be pretty cool because if I'm hoping that one day we can just program our meats and say, here's what I want in a steak. I want this texture. I want this size of fibers. And I wanted to have this level of tenderness or firmness. And I want this much marbling. And, um, and then we could just 3D print it. No, I'm just kidding. We probably won't be able to do that. But that's the idea is I'm sure when this meats come out, it's not going to be all that great. But I think eventually the technology is there to make it really, really great. Not only from the ethical and environmental perspective, but also from the culinary perspective. I think um, it is much more precise of getting the muscle to work with that you actually want to work with. What's the difference in poaching an egg and poaching a fish in oil? I keep hearing about poached fish, but how is that not just deep frying a fish fillet? So poaching is simply lower temperature than deep frying. The goal of poaching is just to get something tender, very slowly and gently. The goal of deep frying is to get something crispy. So if you are deep frying fish, you would be using oil at about 350 Fahrenheit. And if you're poaching fish, you'd be using oil at about 200 Fahrenheit. Um, and for deep fried dishes, very often there is a coating that helps it become crispy, have that little shell. So deep fried fish would usually be dunked in batter and then go in the oil, while poached fish would not have any better because we're not trying to get anything crispy and at 200 Fahrenheit, nothing would get crispy anyway. <laughs> so that's the difference between deep frying and poaching in oil. Blanching vegetables versus boiling vegetables. Is it the same? What does blanching do? Why in some vegetables I boil, potatoes, etc., and some I blanch, leafy greens, asparagus, broccoli, etc. So, um, Procedure-wise, there's not that much difference. The only difference is that very often when you're blanching, uh, you're going to shock the vegetable afterwards in cold water to stop cooking. That's the whole difference is, do you want to cook the vegetable all the way through, like a potato uh, that you're going to cook for, uh, it depends on the potato and the size and potato type, but say you're going to cook it for 20 minutes or so, right? And it's going to be completely tender. And there is no need to stop that potato from overcooking. You don't need to shock it in cold water. You want the creamy, soft, soft potato. But in the cases of green vegetables, you often want them uh, to still be somewhat crunchy. You want to take that grassy, 
taste off but you don't want it to become mushy and so you would do the same procedure as boiling but do it quickly for maybe only a couple of minutes and then put that vegetable into cold water to chill it so that you stop the cooking process quickly. So yeah, that's the whole difference. What are your tips about freezing, defrosting and cooking, eating straight from frozen? I noticed in your fridge tour video that you freeze nuts. What's the deal with that? So yes, I do freeze nuts. That's because nuts are mostly made out of fat and fats go rancid. The same, by the way, applies to your olive oil. It's just that olive oil I go through very quickly, uh, so there's no need to freeze it. But nuts, um, especially if you buy them in like Costco, those are big bags, it might take me a year, maybe more to work through that bag of nuts. And so they might start having a funny taste, like a little weird smell and taste. So if you've ever left your nuts in the pantry and then you tasted them six months later and they taste a little off, that's the thing you can prevent by storing them in the freezer. And the nice thing with nuts is this, they're so little. It's not like you have to defrost the nuts to use them. I just get them out of the freezer and throw them right in the salad or baked good. Wherever I need nuts, I don't bother defrosting them. I just use them as is. Um, you can even eat completely frozen nuts. I mean, it won't have as much flavor, but uh, because nuts have basically no water, they're all fat and protein, um, they do not freeze like ice cubes. They're totally edible, chewable, and have almost the same texture frozen as they do not frozen. So that's the deal with freezing nuts. But most things I do defrost before using. So if I say I froze some um, braised pork, uh, I would put it into my fridge the day before I plan to use it. What equipment is worth spending the money on? Do I need the $400 blenders and mixers and fruit processors? Currently, I'm going to get some high quality pans for the induction stove but I got no baking trays or cake tins. All right, well, so no, you don't need $400 blenders and mixers. I think what you get should be dependent on what you cook. I really don't believe in to some sort of set of well-equipped kitchen should have this and this and the other. I lived without an expensive blender for a very long time and I taught cooking classes <laughs> without having a Vitamix. I now have one. Um, I had a little stick blender and before that I had no, nothing, no blender at all. Um, one thing that I feel strongly about is that you choose dishes appropriate for your cookware. I hear this a lot of like, how do I make ice cream without an ice cream machine? How do I, I don't know, bake a cake without a cake pan? You know, just don't make ice cream. <laughs> I think when I was starting to cook, I constantly tried to do things for which I didn't have equipment. And then I realized that the culinary world is so vast. There's so many things I could cook with the pots and pans that I had that why make your life difficult? And you probably will end up with uh, a dish that won't be that great anyway. So in terms of, you mentioned you don't have any baking trays. I assume that's like half sheets, like basic baking pans and cake tins. Well, a cake tin, if you're like me, who needs a cake tin? I don't bake cakes, like basically ever. But a basic baking tray full, for me, that's huge because of roasting vegetables. I roast an awful lot of vegetables. And because of that, a basic half sheet is huge for me. Like I've got to have that. Uh, but here's my approach with mixers, right? So say you don't want a stand mixer. Totally understandable. I lived without a stand mixer for a long time. But you just need to choose your baked goods wisely, right? So something like focaccia, you could do by hand. You could knead that by hand, you know? But something like brioche, you probably don't want to go into that territory without a mixer. Um, and you could get a basic little hand mixer for cakes and things like that. I never understood the logic of using salt to extract water, which results in a juicy, moist final product. How is that possible? So yes, it is a little bit counterintuitive, right? If we put salt on some protein, say a steak, salt will draw moisture to the outside, right? So you're thinking, wait a second, how is that going to be juicier if I'm pulling water out of it? 
Ah, but here is what happens. So you pull water out of it, then the salt dissolves in that water, and then that salty water goes back into the steak. Not all of it. You'll never pull every last drop of it in, but you will pull the majority of it in. That's why salting a head only works if you give it sufficient time. If you give it 10 minutes, it's not really going to work. Now, the beautiful thing about getting that salt inside the meat is that it changes the structure of the protein helping the protein retain more moisture as you raise the heat on it so if you thought that oh i salted my steak and now it's damp look at all that water i removed well that my friend is small potatoes compared to how much moisture you're going to lose when you turn the heat up and cook that steak uh, most meats lose a crazy amount of their weight which is all water during the cooking time and so if that meat was salted in advance and the salt had the chance to penetrate the muscle and change that protein structure during the cooking time you will lose less moisture so yes you will lose a little bit extra moisture to the, on the surface in the beginning but you will not lose as much moisture during the cooking time can you explain how to cook ground meat pork beef so it stays moist all right, so I assume we're talking about things that are well done, like meatballs and fillings for things and meatloaf, not burgers. Because if we're talking about burgers, I recently made the videos about how to cook a medium rare burger. So, um, and of course, that probably would only apply to beef. I don't know about medium rare pork burgers, <laughs> but um, when it comes to meatballs and meatloaf, uh, what you need there are several things you need to keep them moist and tender. One is fat. Make sure you're not using lean ground beef or pork. It needs to have at least 15 to 20 percent of that meat should be fat. Uh, the second thing is a bread product, either bread crumbs or just bread that people often soak it in milk or water or buttermilk so that will absorb all that juice that your meat will release during cooking and it will get absorbed into that bread product and stay inside your meatballs or meatloaf so that's very very important it's not a filler it's not just to stretch that meat and yield a little more meatballs it gives you much much better texture um, another trick I find that although it's become very, very popular, it makes some difference. It doesn't make an enormous difference like the first two things is gelatin. So if you add some gelatin, usually you'd have to bloom that gelatin. Basically, you make jelly out of that gelatin and chop it up really finely or just break it up and add into the meat mixture. That will make it more tender. Um, now, the reason people started doing that is that um, they noticed that veal produces much better results. So usually something sold as meatloaf mix that might be used for meatloaves or meatballs has beef, pork and veal. And since veal is sometimes expensive or hard to find, um, what veal gives you is a lot of the gelatin. And so people started just adding gelatin straight to pork or beef. So fat, bread product, gelatin. That's the three things that will keep your ground meat absolutely wonderful. All right. And I think that's all the questions I have for today. Um, stay tuned. Come back next week. I'll try to make another Q&A video on the topic of heat. Um, and thank you so much for all your questions.